So I'm going to do that just because elders and brothers, I'm sure Mr. Amad Dizet has not did any introduction, but uh, just to mention one point that, uh, you know, when a student starts to study post-metric, he goes to university, he does a bachelor's degree, then he does an honors degree, then he does a master's, becomes a master of his subject, then he becomes a doctorate of his subject, can become a professor, and when he's passed all these stages, he knows it so well, he's more than a master, he becomes a mister of the subject. And it is in this spirit that I refer to Ahmad Dizad as Mr. Ahmad Dizad. Because in the field of comparative studies, especially Christianity, he has more than mastered the subject, and I think he deserves the title of Mr. Ahmad Dizad. And it is in that sense that I think I refer to him. To that extent that I was this morning in the office, and I heard them arranging a symposium in after Ramadan in the Royal Albert Hall. He's having a symposium with an American professor. So we can see in the level at which Mr. Ahmad Dizet is. But we haven't heard much on his other knowledge on other religions. And it is in this spirit that I approached him, and it is in this spirit that he is here today. Because a man of his learning and experience, I don't think we should lose out while he is around. And uh, it is in this spirit that he is present here today. And I must say, at such short notice, and knowing how busy he is with such tight programs, I still can't figure out how he manages to squeeze this uh, lecture in this evening. Just one point before I tell Mr. Amadeira to commence. You see, he has been criticized in many circles for one simple reason is that he calls the spade a spade. We intellectuals will tend to use euphemism and try to, you know, use very different terms and sometimes we lose sight of what we are describing. And the truth is the truth. And he calls a spade a spade. He's a simple man and I think he gets down to simple things and that's what makes him so great. And therefore tonight, the intention and the spirit with which he's going to present his subject is not that he's going to paint any picture for us. The pictures have already been painted. And what Mr. Didad is going to do, he is not the painter of the pictures. He is the viewer, and he's going to explain them to us. And it is in this spirit we should take it. So without much ado, I will call upon Mr. Ahmad Didad. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وذاق الباطل إن الباطل كان ذهوب وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا حصارا صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman and brethren the subject that had been suggested to me by Brother Ridwan uh, by Rafiq, I think he forgot to mention the subject. The subject for this evening's talk is Hinduism and Islam. Chronologically, in order of age, Islam is the youngest of the world's religions, and Hinduism and Zoroastrianism, they both vie for being the oldest religions in the world. From Islam, if we go backwards, beginning with Islam, 1400 years ago, our Nabi Karim وسلم, brought this deen of Islam to its perfection at the guidance of God. But 600 years beyond Islam, we find the religion of Christianity. As 600 years before that, Buddhism. And a few thousand years before that, Hinduism. So Hinduism claims to be the oldest of the world's religions. Where does this word Hinduism come from? It comes from the Indus River. It's a river passing through uh, Pakistan. 
in undivided India in the northwest, the Indus River. And people have certain characteristics in speech that sometimes where there is no H, they add an H. Where there is H, people eat it up. You know, describing the situation in the city hall I was mentioning to our people, I said, you see, there is a group of people among us, Indians, our own people, that they pick up H in Hambilo, you know, Hambilo, they say Hambilo, and they drop it off in Hillary, Hillary, they say Hillary. <laughs> so, same thing happens to this Indus business, this Indus river, people say Indus, Indus, there was no H, they put her. Hindus, Hindu, people living around the Indus Valley, Hindu. The land, Hindu. So this is how this name has been given, Hinduism. The ism or the culture or the setup or the beliefs of these people of the Indus Valley, Hindu. Now, if I were to give you in one word, the difference between Islam and Hinduism. One word. You see, the Hindu, in his theology, he says, everything is God. Everything is God. The Muslim, what does he say? He says, everything is God's. The difference is only that of an apostrophe S. Hindu says everything is him. Islam says everything is his. Everything belongs to Allah. The other guy says everything is he. So, and this little apostrophe S, you know what a stupendous difference it makes into a concept of God. That if you say everything is he, everything is he, then therefore the Hindu, according to that concept, he doesn't hesitate in worshipping the cow, monkey, the elephant, the snake, man, woman, trees, sea, mountains, anything, everything. Because he reasons that, look, God created everything by his word. Everything, how did he create? We also believe that Allah created by his will. But you somehow are well, up. He said to him, Allah is due, the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. That whenever he decrees a matter, he merely says to it, be and it is. See, his word of command. Actually, this is will. We describe it as a word. So everything he created by his word. And Allah tells us in the Holy Quran that if the oceans were made into ink and all the trees were made into pen, the words of our Lord cannot be exhausted. So many creations. Everything by his word, in other words, by his will, he brought everything into being. So now, because it is the word of God that brought things into being, the Hindu says the word of God is God. His word is God. We say the word of God is not God, it is his word. As I am speaking to you, my words are not me. See, me and my words are different. Similarly, the Muslim reason, the word of Allah and him are different things. They are his word, but they are not him. The Hindu says, his word is him. This is. So he starts worshipping anything and everything. As such, he is a pantheist. See, we are thinking wrongly of the Hindu, thinking that he is a polytheist. Polytheist means believing in more than one God. He doesn't. Though he can't explain. Then he says, Rama is God. He says, Krishna is God. He said, Buddha is God. He said, Hanuman is God. So you ask him, how many gods are there? He's confused. But really, he doesn't believe in many gods. He said, everything is God, because God is in everything. So he's prepared to go worship God in this form, and that form, and that form, and endless form. But he said, God is one. He says, God is one. So he is a pantheist, one who believes that everything is God, not a polytheist believing in many gods. Now, when we talk about Hinduism, immediately in our minds, these terms, they occur, they come to mind, incarnation. Incarnation. 
reincarnation, karma, idolatry, Hinduism associated with all these terms, terminology. Incarnation, a system in which people believe that God Almighty comes down to earth as a man. He becomes human being. God Almighty, he comes down to earth, born of a woman, he becomes a man. Incarnation, meaning God taking human form. Reincarnation, meaning when you die, it's not the end, but you will come back to life again on this earth. And you die again, and you can come back to again onto this earth. Again and again, until you reach perfection. It can be a million rebirths. You can be born a million times over. Until you reach nirvana, peace and absorption with God. Then you can rule the universe with God. You become one with God. You become God. That's reincarnation. Being born again and again into this world in human form. Karma is the philosophy of believing a law of cause and effect. That every cause has an effect. You put your finger into the fire, you get burnt. Cause, effect. If you eat too much, you have a stomachache. Cause, effect. But now, the Hindu believes that that effect takes place here on this earth. We believe that there is a cause and effect, but it will be on a higher plane. We will have to account for our deeds. That's Islam. We believe that every cause has an effect. Whatever you do, you are going to be recompensated, good or bad. As you sow, so you will reap. Whatever you sow, you will get the fruits of it, good or bad. But that does not necessarily take place on this earth, that you don't have to come back here on this earth to give an account. And idolatry, meaning they believe they're worshipping God through the means of different, different statues, idols. Now, it is not possible during the period of this talk to give you like a clinical analysis of all these terms, going deep, because each and every one becomes a subject. Actually, Hinduism is such a vast thing that it calls for a series of talks, not just one talk, to give you in one brief nutshell, say, look, this is Hinduism. But for the purpose of this discussion tonight, we will be forced to give you a broad outline of the things that I have just mentioned. And in passing, you'll be able to see them all, inshallah. Now, as we are gathered here, from what I can see, we are all Indian Muslims. I don't know if there is an Arab among you. Is there? Any Arabs here? No. Huh? No. Any Malays? No. As a people as a whole that we have gathered here, it looks like we are all of Indian extraction. Now, one of the easiest ways of trying to approach the Hindu, to talk to him, to reason with him is to confess at the outset that our people, you know, our forefathers were Hindus. I know when I was young, I was getting shocked, you know, when the Hindu pointed the thing and said, you people were, are Hindus. He's trying to say that you were also Hindus. You see, he didn't know how to say that, so you are Hindus. Or maybe when he said you are Hindus, meaning you are from Hind. See, Hind is the word for India. India. Say so India, Hind. You are from Hind. So they're thinking that everybody from Hind is a Hindu. See, whereas for everybody from Hind is a Hindi. We are all Hindis. In English you say Indian. See? We are Hindis, but we are not Hindus. Hindi and Hindus are different things. The guy is getting confused. He thinks now, being from him, you are Hindi, being you are Hindu. So no, our forefathers were Hindus. And we have been Hindus for 5,000 years. If somebody wishes to claim that he's got some Arab blood in him, good luck to him. Somebody says we've got some Persian blood in him, good luck to you. Somebody says we've got some Turkish blood in us, good luck to you. But coming from India, our ancestors were all Hindu. Now, once you confess that, you see, it makes it easier for the Hindu to listen to you. Our people, my people, what happened? How is it that this guy is talking differently now? 
So now you start coaching the subject. And I have been using a technique. You know, I live in Berlin. That's about 30 kilometers outside Durban. And Berlin is today Indian, according to Ogon regulations. The majority of the people are Indian, so they made it an Indian township. Coming from Berlin, Ottawa, Indian, Mount Echkon, Indian. And as I come from Berlin, come going to Durban, I find some Indian people standing by the roadside, so I give them lift. It's something that is uh, out, seems to be beyond my control. Though my wife keeps on telling me, she said, don't give lift to anybody. Because we have been reading about things, you know, what happens if people give lift and they get bashed and the cars get stolen and they don't find their husbands anymore. But somehow I feel that the Indian who's standing on the roadside, he's not waiting to bash you on the head. The Indian. The white man, unfortunately, we have to say it's again and again he bashes his benefactor. The most dangerous guy in South Africa is the white man. Not the Indian. Not the colored, not the African. If he wants to bash your head, he'll come and look for you. He'll find you and he'll do his job. But he won't stand on the roadside waiting for a lift to do, the, to do that. So I'm compelled, you know, some type of compulsion, inner compulsion. See an Indian, I just want to go on, but I can't help it. I stop the car as it's get inside. Now, once a fellow gets inside the car, I must talk to him. I want to make him pay for the lift, not in money, but you know, we must do a job of work. So immediately I start, I says, what church do you belong to? And if you ask that question, you know, it's an innocent question. Nobody gets offended by such a question. What church do you belong to? So either he says, any church, he gives you a name, or he might say, I'm a Hindu. Now, if he says he is a Christian, he is a type of a customer. Sometimes I give a white guy a lift, and I know he is a Christian. I said, what, I, what church you belong to? He gives me a name. I says, you know, once you know he's a Christian. He says, you know that there are three types of Indians in South Africa? And the guy gets a shock. There are three types of Indians in South Africa. He doesn't know. To him, all Indians are the same. You can see our complexions. I know there are various shades of gray. But overall, you know, there is a dial about us all that says Indian, 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 Indian. No, my one is light and one is a little darker and one is darker still. But Indian, 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 Indian. So he says, no, what, what's talking about three types of Indians? To him, there's only one type of Indian. As much as to our fathers, there was only one type of white man, European. See, when I was young, when he said European, we thought European was a nation. And the South African government also put it that way. European, non-Europeans. That's how they classified us in our tramways, in the railways, everywhere. European, non-European. So European, we are thinking, is a nation. But we know better now that European is not a nation. They are now changing to whites and blacks. But European is not a nation. Europe is a continent. And on that continent, there are many nations, like the Greeks, the French, the Germans, the Italians, the Swedes, the English, the Irish, the Scotch. These are different nations. But because we don't know the difference, all white people is one nation. Similarly, they say all brown people are one nation. So it's when you tell them that there are three types of Indians in South Africa, they get the shock of their life. I says, you know, racially, we are dozens of different kinds. Racially. And the proof of that is, this is Gujarati Muslim, they call me Surti. There is a Memon. There is a Kokni, there is a Nyabai, there is a Hyderabadi with apologies. Mean no insult. You know the people from Hyderabad when I met them in America, they are beating the breast of your Hyderabadis. And Hyderabad, you know, in central India, Hyderabad, the Nawab of Hyderabad, Nizam of Hyderabad was there. They were a highly cultured people. One of the most educated people in India are the Hyderabadis. But here in South Africa, because the term was being used disparagingly for our Urdu-speaking brethren, so now it seems like an insult to say Hyderabadis. But the Hyderabadis in America, I met them, they're beating the breath. Yeah, Hyderabadis. Yeah, Hyderabadis. I'm Hyderabad here. Yeah. What do you think? You know, like you people, from Gujarat, from Bombay, from here, we are Hyderabadis. So no insult intended. 
So we are dozens of different nations, really. But religiously, there are three main groups, the Indian Hindu, the Indian Christian, and the Indian Muslim. Religiously, three main groups. Racially, dozens of different kinds. Among the Hindus, dozens of different kinds. Among the Muslims, dozens of different kinds. Races. So these three main groups, as you tell, there are three main, there are three different types of religions. So there's an Indian Hindu, Indian Christian, Indian Muslim. And now, what is the main difference between the three? Actually, the guy is thinking that you are educating him. But this is how you brainwash people. You know, you program people. You make them to accept in a story form. You're telling the guy as if you're telling story, as if you're educating the guy. He says, you know, there's an Indian Hindu, Indian Christian, Indian Muslim. What is the main difference between them? Yes and no. So he says, you see, the Indian Hindu, in his philosophy of religion, he believes in God's incarnates, meaning God coming down to earth as a man. That's the Hindu philosophy. And in that system of incarnation, God taking human form, they believe that Rama was the seventh incarnation of God. Krishna was the eighth incarnation of God. Buddha was the ninth incarnation of God. And they believe in endless incarnations. See the Hindu reasons. And his logic is very good. His logic is very good. The Hindu. He's a very logical person. Give him that credit. He says that God Almighty is so pure, is so holy, is absolute holiness. If we agree with that. al quddus the Holy One, this is his, one of his attributes in the Quran. He's al quddus the Holy One. So the Hindu also says he's absolute holiness. He's like a holy robo. Now that holy robo, that's how he thinks now. What does he know? How man feels? Man, Let's say he sees a beautiful young thing. What does he know how the man feels? Does he feel the way man feels? Probably not. Then say, so what right has he to lay down rules for us? What does he know? <laughs> like somebody jokingly remarked about the Pope. Pope. See, the Pope made his pronouncement on the pill, you know, birth control, pill. So somebody remarked that the guy who doesn't play the game, what right has he to lay down the rules? <laughs> Does he play the games we play, the Pope? No. Then what right has he to tell us? You know, <laughs> you know fertile period and infertile period, what the hell he knows about fertile and infertile? <laughs> Similarly, the Hindu reason, he said, look, does God play the games we play? Probably not. And what right has he to tell us? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. What does he know what is to covet? <laughs> so to be qualified, he should come down to earth as a man. He's born like any other human child. And as he's growing up, somebody's playing fool with his mother in the absence of his father. And you know how he great, how he feels. As he's growing up, somebody's playing fool with his sister. Now he knows how it feels. Now he's married, somebody will have to pinch his wife. Now he knows how he feels. So he's qualified. Now he's qualified to tell you, thou shalt not commit adultery, because he knows what adultery is. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, because now he knows what he is to covet. He's qualified. Now that is the Hindu idea for justification for incarnation, God becoming a man. The Christian, he says, that before Jesus, God did not incarnate. After Jesus, he will not incarnate. He will not take human form. He is the only incarnation, meaning only time that God came down to earth as a man, he came in the form of Jesus Christ. What does the Muslim say? The Muslim says God does not incarnate at all. He doesn't become human at all. What does he do? He chooses a man from among men, one of us, flesh and blood in all respects. But that person is so finely attuned, he's so sincere to God, that whatever God Almighty commands him on a higher spiritual level, what we call revelation, the electromagnetic wave of the spiritual world, that person hears those signals, those messages, and he conveys them to us on our human level, sound wave. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. And you see, on our human level, we can understand what he's talking about. Such a person, we say, is a prophet of God. 
He's a mouthpiece of God. He's speaking the words of God, but he's not God. So the Hindu believes in many incarnations, the Christian believes in one incarnation, the Muslim believes in many incarnations. Now this is in a nutshell. See, the Muslim reasons that how can the Almighty, how can the ocean be contained in a bottle? The Almighty, in a little puny thing like you, this. No, this is the Muslim concept. No, God has not become a man. And it is not necessary for God to become a man, to understand the problem of man, because this logic is true. It's logical, but it's not true. If it is true, then God must make up, become a monkey to understand the problem of a monkey. He must become a donkey to understand the problem of a donkey. He must become a cockroach to understand the problem of a cockroach. What kind of a God is this? He says, no, the Creator knows what he has made. If you made the table, you know what the table is. You don't have to become a table to understand a table. If you make the beetle false wahan, outside, you don't have to become a beetle false wahan to understand the false wahan. The maker knows what he has made. If God made us, he knows. And as such, he is qualified and he, is authority, or he has the authority to dictate to you, to tell you how this machine ought to behave. He has a right to give you instruction. He doesn't have to become a man to understand the problem of man. Now, about a hundred years ago, You know, when we came to this country, the average Indian was 80% Hindu, 20% Muslim, and 1% Christian. So when I had these Hindus getting into the car, I present this to them. I said, you know, when we came, our forefathers, 100 years ago, this was our average ratio of our people. But I said, today, you know what? The Muslim is still 20% of the Indian population. In other words, if we lost half a dozen, we might have gained a dozen. Overall, the average remained the same. But the Christian has jumped from 1 to 17 percent in the Indian community. 1 to 17. So I'm asking where did the other 16 percent come from? In a flying saucer? From outer space? No. He agrees quickly. He says, no, it's from the Hindu. So the question arises, why is it that the Hindu is getting converted and the Muslim is not getting converted? Ah, not in total. I mean, we can also lose our sons and daughters, which we are, you see? But if we lost half a dozen, we might have gained a dozen. So overall, the average has to remain the same. But the Hindu has been reduced by 16% in the past 50 years, not the 100 years. Because most of this propagation work among the Indians has been done by the Christians in the past 50 years. They lost 16% of the people. And at this rate, in a thousand years, there will be, you know, the Hindu will be a museum thing, museum piece. If you come across a person, you know, your grandchildren, they say, what church you belong to? It's a Hindu side. Hindu <laughs> This is what's going to happen. Because the way, at the rate at which they are losing, it will be like something should be in a museum. So what are you doing there? So the question is, how is it that the Hindu is getting converted wholesale and the Muslim is not? And he knows that. We are not saying, we are not denying that we could have lost our sons and daughters. Uh, the young man wanted to show his father a point. Or he met a Christian woman and somehow he went head over heels. It, these things can happen. Or sometimes people can be brainwashed or mixed marriages. We married non-Muslim women for the marriage of convenience. We converted the woman and uh, she was neither here nor there. She was neither fish nor fowl and the marriage broke up. And your Muhammad and your Fatimas and your Khadijas gone back again with the mother to the church and Christian. It, it's happening again and again. We are losing thousands that way. These marrying, you know, outside Islam. You marry a colored woman, beautiful thing. Right, and the marriage doesn't work out. Look, among ourselves, there are times when marriages don't work out. And there are more chances of the marriages breaking if the woman is from the other side. Culturally, her stance from everything is different. She's used to jiving and, you know, going around with this guy and that guy, half a dozen guys she has experienced. And now you think, now you got everybody's chewed bones. Now you put it around your neck, make a garland out of it, and the garland doesn't work. <laughs> so where do your children go? Back again. She goes back to her aunties, her grannies, and your little ones, are, she's going to church. They also go to church. So we have been losing that way, you see. But 
as a people, as a whole, we are immune to convulsions as a whole. So what makes it that the Hindu is getting converted and the Muslim not? So he might have had a guess to say, well, you know, our people are very ignorant about our religion. I said, look, like that, we also have ignorant fools among us. Muslims, who don't know how to read the Quran, they don't know how to make salah, they're elementary things they don't know about Islam, but they're Muslim, born in a Muslim home, carrying a Muslim flag, and when they die, we'll bury them as Muslims. But perhaps they know nothing about Islam. It's, it's there. From experience, I know it is so. So we also have ignorant people among us, as much as you have. But I said, look, I might explain to you the reason. I may be wrong, but if I'm wrong, we would, I would like you to correct me. I said, you see, the Hindu is a very tolerant person in, at all, <coughs> among them. Not now in India. They're the most intolerant, you see. But the Hindu in his own family life is very tolerant. You see, in a Hindu family, in a Hindu family, uh, if one of them, the father says, I believe in Ganesh, the elephant-headed god. The other guy says, I worship Sifa, no problem. The other guy says, I worship Hanuman, no problem. The other guy says, I worship Sita, no problem. The one says, I believe in one god, no problem. The other guy says, I believe in no god, no problem. The other guy says, I believe in million god, no problem. No problem. There's no fight. The Hindu will not fight as long as he says he's a Hindu. You say you're a Hindu, you can believe what you like. The only time trouble would start is when he says, now nah, I'm a Christian. Maybe there's a reaction. Now he says, from now on I'm a Muslim. There's a reaction. But if you say you're a Hindu, and you say you believe Muhammad is also a prophet, no problem. If you say Jesus is also God, no problem. As long as you read in the label. <laughs> you see? So he is very tolerant as far as that is concerned. And in his system, he believes and he worships man gods, women gods, <laughs> animal gods, anything, everything. So once he is used to worshipping one type of man god, it is not difficult for him to change from one man god to another. So he is already used to worshipping man gods. And his man gods, you know, if you see them, his, his man gods, here is an example here, this is Siva, is blue. See, is blue. Look, like this Hanuman is blue. This Rama in the background, blue. This Krishna is look purplish here, but it's blue in the religious pictures. So what is this? You see, Rama is blue, Krishna is blue, and blue is an ugly color on the body of man. Our oh, brother here has got a blue jacket on. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Your wife's blue dress, nothing wrong with it. You wear the blue denim trousers, nothing wrong with it. Blue shirt, nothing wrong with it. But on the body of man, when a man goes blue, you rush him to hospital. <laughs> lack, of, lack of oxygen creates that. See? Danger. Then why should they give such an unnatural color to the God? I said, you see, blue, this word blue is beautiful. Really. It has so many meanings. Blue. We talk about the blue sky, the blue sea. Color, that's color. Blue sky, blue sea. And then you find the guys talking fat lot about religion. And the police roadblock there. And they stop him and they get blue films in his car. <laughs> <laughs> so blue mint means film. Huh? Blue mint, blue color. Now blue means film, the blue film. Then they speak about the blue-blooded Englishman. <laughs> you know what it means? It means pure-blooded. So blue now stands for purity. Blue means filth, now blue means purity. Then when I'm giving the guy a lift, he puts his hand in my pocket, so I grab him by the hand, and he goes blue in the face. <laughs> you know what it means? He went cold. <laughs> what he says, he went blue in the face. Huh? Or the guy makes a promise, I'd like to meet you again. And my companion asked me, that guy, you know, that certain day you gave me a lift, you said, did he meet you again? I said, ah, guys like that, man, you get them once in a blue moon. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, once in a while. Can you see? So blue, man, has got so many conflicting meanings. 
blue means filth, blue means clean, blue means cold, blue means once in a while, blue means beautiful sky, anything, everything. So now but a blue god, compared to a blue god, now they present to you a blonde god. White. See, Jesus Christ, blonde hair, blue eyes, handsome features, like, um, like an Englishman or a German, a Nordic type, not with the poly nose, you know, the crooked nose, you know, like a Jew. No, no, no. Because if you see a picture like that of Jesus Christ, everybody will say, Shiloh, Shiloh. <laughs> so they give him a straight nose. See, like an Englishman or a Swede or a Norwegian or a Dane, not like a Jew. And we are all suffering from an inferiority complex. All of us. Whether Muslim or Hindu. You know, we are coming from India. That white man has been ruling us for 150 years. A handful of them, they knocked hells into us there. They enslaved us for 150 years. And here in this country, a handful of whites, 4 million whites ruling 20 million blacks at the moment, and we can do nothing about it. You know, how do you feel? 20 million blacks! And you can do nothing. Well under control. So we are awed by the white man. So this white man comes along into your house. He takes your little brother or sister on his lap, or your daughter or your son, and pats him on the head. How do you feel? More especially the Hindu, worshipping this man God and that man God. To him, a God has come into his house. See, he's awed. And then the guy terrifies them. You're going to go to hell. You know, it's an easy way out for you. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Otherwise, all your good deeds are like filthy rags. You're all going to go to hell. So the poor guy is getting converted. Getting converted. But an amazing thing is this, that the Hindu is like, we say in Gujarati, Allah is a garib guy. It's Allah's cow, you know, free for all. Like our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, like knowledge is a stray camel of the desert. Wherever you find it, you take it. This Hindu is also willing to be taken. But the Muslim is not selling, he's not talking, he doesn't want the color. And that's genuine. We are racist, I'm telling you. The Muslim, the Indian Muslim, he is no better than the caste Hindu, the racist Hindu. We are looking down upon that, we are, we are the guy, you know, we are terrified about what he's doing to us in India. The caste Hindu, we great, we cry. You know, we are, you know, so, so enslaved in India that the amount of rights that take place, average of two rights a day are taking place in India against our people. And we can't even cry. You know that? We are 120 million Muslims in India, but you can't even cry while you're hitting us. That's how demoralized we have become. The thing is, the Muslim is really not interested in conversion. The only time he wants to convert our Madrasi brethren, our Tamil Telugu brethren, our Hindustani cousins. You know when? When our daughters are running away with them. Already ran away, maybe registered, maybe carrying his baby. Now she wants your blessings she says, get her married. That's the only time you are interested in converting the guy. Otherwise, we are actually pushing them out. Because as a young man, I still remember, you know, the elders talking, some our oh, Madrasi brother comes along, you know, uh, and sheepishly, he says, you know, he's interested in Islam. And I've been listening to our elders talking, telling them. He says, you know, we'll cut you. Again and again. Circumcise you. <laughs> you don't say circumcise because they didn't know that word is to be. You say, we'll cut you. You want to be cut? So the poor fellow gets cold feet. <laughs> Actually, this is our way of pushing him out. <laughs> I don't know whether our mentality has changed. Maybe we don't use those terms anymore. But the mentality doesn't change. And as a, as a result of that, the punishment Allah is giving us. Our daughters are running away wholesale with the mushrik, wholesale, and wholesale is a mild term. I like to see a guy coming along to me now and telling me, he says, you know, it is those, they were telling, my people were telling. Now it happens in the population barracks, it happens in the magazine barracks, or now we can see it happens in Chatsworth, it happens in Phoenix. Not my people, you know, we are the Gujarati Boras, we are Katorian. I say, you Katorian? Show you your daughter. You say, you are Kulwadian? I say, I'll show you your daughter. What are you? You say, you're Myabai, I say, show your daughter. You say, you're Kanami, I say, show your daughter. There isn't a guy who can say that, look, my community is not immune from this fire, that we are not getting singed. Anybody, who are you, what are you? And 
my daughter is not your daughter. You have no feeling if Sabo I lost my daughter. No, you have no feeling. It doesn't hurt you. What kind of pigs are you then? I want to know. You have no feeling for my child? But unfortunately, it's a very sad thing to say that the Muslim is not interested in wanting to convert. People talk about, you know, doing dawah work. I say, ah, let him carry on. But the community is not interested. They are interested in you. One Muslim is interested in you. They want to convert to convert. You see? So you, why don't you keep a beard? Huh? You? You got a nice beard, Rafiq. Why don't you make it stand aside? <laughs> <laughs> that other brother I saw has got a nice beard there, but he shaved his mustache. <laughs> so I said, you know, how our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that you must trim your mustache, not shave your <laughs> Busy, busy with that. Salami or no salami? Salami or no salami? We must lift up our hands in dua or pray like that. <laughs> Whether we must say dua loudly or silently. <laughs> Man, we are busy, 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 you know, bashing each other. At the slightest little provocation, the slightest difference, we want to kill one another. But the ocean in which we are, we're getting absorbed. Our daughters are running away wholesale. And now the Christians are also making inroads. Nobody's interested. Nobody talks about it. As if the problem doesn't exist. Because it hurts us to think about it, to talk about it. But now, oh Hindu, I tell you, Wallah, the guy is so receptive. You know, you explain things to him. And you know, by the time I reach Durban, you see, the guy says, Uncle, I've never heard anything in my life before like this. You know, the history of, of people. I says, you know, look, man, we were one people. And the proof. I said, you see, I'm a Gujarati Muslim. I speak Gujarati. My forefathers were Banya Hindus. Nothing to be ashamed of. We should be proud of the fact that Allah Barithala made our forefathers to see the light. And they have been freed from all the mire in which we were. So, I said, I'm a Gujarati Muslim. My forefathers were Hindus. You see the Banya and me, one nation. We look alike. We speak the same language, Kemche, Samuche, same language. We eat the same puri patas and bhajiyas, <laughs> like the Banya. And we have the same surnames. I said, look, there's a Muslim Patel, there's a Banya Patel. Banya means Hindu. Muslim Patel, Banya Patel. Muslim Desai, Banya Desai. Muslim Bula, Banya Bula. Bawa and Bula, Muslim. And Bula and Sons, Hindu. Parak, Muslim Parak, Hindu Parak. Every surname that you find among the Hindus, you find among the Muslims. What does it mean? It means at one time we were also all Hindus. Why should you be ashamed of that? You should be happy that Allah Bari Tala showed you that our ancestors had the courage of the conviction to change. And how did it happen? Another story. You see, sometimes you start another story. I says, you know, I come from the west coast of India. <laughs> Above Bombay there is a small port called Surat. There is a Tapti river running through the town, small river. And sailing boats come to Surat and they go, as they were coming and going for hundreds of years. Arab traders, they brought their dates to barter for our muslin cloth, our turmeric, our tamarind. And when prayer time came, one of them gave the azan. You know, the Muslim called to prayer. You must have heard it sometime. Yeah, yeah, it's in here. So the guy starts shouting, in there on the riverside, I'm talking about a few hundred years ago. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. Actually, I'm educating the fellow, what the whole Azan is all about. He says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. He said, I bear witness that there is no other object of worship but Allah. He repeats twice. He says, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He repeats it twice. Yes, we are being warned. He says, you know, he says, Muhammad is only a messenger. He's not God. He's not the son of God. He says, don't make a mistake like the others have done. They made the prophets into gods. They made the heroes into gods. Don't you do that. Five times a day we are being warned. And Alhamdulillah, that message has gone out. Nobody says Muhammad sallallahu is God. Nobody says that he's Allah. He's God Almighty. Nobody says that. Or he's the son of God. Nobody says that. Says, Five times a day you're being reminded. Then he says, if you believe in these two fundamentals, that there is one God and Muhammad is his messenger, then what is the message? He continues, the Muazzin, the one who gives the Azan, the call. 
Sahayala Salat, Jesus come to prayer. Hayala Salat, Jesus come to prayer. Hayala Pala, Jesus come to success. Because this is real success. That you remind yourselves about your duties and obligations towards your Creator and your duties and obligations towards your fellow human being. If you want to be successful, there is no other way. And he winds up the call by saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that Allah is still the greatest, Allah is still the greatest. Whether you come or you do not come, you are not going to lower him in his exaltation, in his majesty, in his glory, he's still going to be supreme. And the final words of warning he gives, is, La ilaha illallah, that there is no other object of worship but Allah. In other words, you can keep on worshipping your man gods, your woman gods, your money gods, but remember this, that the only one, only one who deserves to be worshipped is him. This is the national anthem of the Muslims wherever they live. But now, on the riverside, in Surat, my ancestors, they heard somebody wailing in the wilderness. What did it sound like? Because that's what it sounds like if you don't know what the words are. Don't listen like that. Oh, no. he's, he's lengthening the sound so the voice may travel. But to the non-believer, non-Muslim who hasn't heard the words, what is it to him? Man crying. Something has gone wrong. So I said, now my ancestors went to investigate. Somebody in trouble. And when they came there, you know, if these people were a hundred, one guy takes a lead and 99 follow. If there were half a dozen, one guy takes a lead and five follow. So they are there. And they're going up and down, up and down, looking this way, looking that way, <laughs> lifting up the hands. When they finish the prayer, they're thanking the Almighty for his many mercies and praying to Allah, say, Ya Bari Tala, make us successful in our business and then when we are successful, when we return home, we want to find our family safe and sound. This is what the whole thing is about. And when they're finished, they find the customers are waiting. <laughs> so my Hindu ancestors, you know we Banyas, we are highly intelligent people, very clever, you know that. <laughs> Look at the businesses, who has them all? Industries, who has them all? The Banya Muslim. The Gujarati Muslim. It's gone, come. Who's got <laughs> Who's got it? Who's the fools? <laughs> <laughs> See, among the Hindus, the Banya. Among the Muslims, the Banya Muslim. Admit it, admit it. <laughs> that Allah has given the Banya Muslim something a little extra with his mathematics, you know, that he can work out very, very easily, you know, how to make profit. The other guys don't know so well. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> So, my Banya ancestors, you know, they're arguing with these Arabs. They were you doing? Going up and down, up and down, looking this way, looking that way. He said, no, we are praying. So praying to who? See, my ancestors couldn't pray without having something in front of them, in a statue or a picture. I'll show you some gods of my ancestors. He said, they can't pray. So what are you praying? You don't see anything there. What are you worshiping? The river god? He said, no. But the tree god? He says, no. Then what God are you worshipping? So the Arab explained, he said, we are worshipping the unseen God of the universe, who is beyond the imagination of the mind of man. We know he exists, and we know he's real, but it's not like anything we can think or imagine. My Hindu ancestors were not to be undone by such logic reasoning. He says, you know, we're not like you. You worship a God you can't see, you can't feel, you can't touch. It's not like you. you. You know, we worship the sun. You know what the sun is doing for us. You know, he says, we worship the... <coughs> Cow, we know what the cow is doing for us. You know, we worship the sea. We know what the sea is doing for us. Not like you. You worship a God, you can't see, you can't feel, you can't touch. <laughs> so they had a reason with my ancestors. They said, look, the sun is a wonderful thing. You see, without the sun, no life. If there's no sun, there's no life. But tell me now, did the sun make the gra grass? He says, no. Did the sun make the chicken? He says, no. Did the sun make you? He says, no. He says, you see, somebody made the sun. For your benefit. And the sun is doing its job. It's following a law and an order. So precisely that it's working that we can, you know, through mathematics and astronomy, we can predict the eclipse of the sun a thousand years from hence. Every eclipse of the sun you can, you can work it out. You can write it down. And to the minute, to the second. And you can say that from Durban to be visible, but you won't be able to see it from Johannesburg. Or you'll be able to see it in, from Timbuktu, but in Southern Africa you won't see it. 
Or you can work it out for a million year hence. You know why? Because it's following a law and an order so precise, so exact, more exact than the best watches on the wrist. But can the sensei tomorrow say, I won't come out? No. So the sun is doing its bidding, so we must thank the one who put it there. And the cow, oh, the cow too is a fantastic animal. You know, we get our milk, our butter, our, our ghee, and the cow dung makes such wonderful compost, better than any, any fertilizer you can buy. A wonderful creature, you see. Does the cow make itself? He says, no. Can the cow say from tomorrow, I won't give milk? He says, no. He says, look, somebody made the cow for your benefit. You must thank the one who made it. And on and on. The sea, he says, the sea too. He says, you know, without the sea, all the filth and the mud that get washed into the ocean after every rainfall, it will ferment and will create gases that will kill all living things. But by the mercy of God, the gravity, gravitation is churning up the waters, or digesting the filth and the rubbish that it might not kill us. So, the one who has made all these things, we must thank him. So, between two brothers, Chagan and Magan, Magan saw the light and he became Musalman, and Chagan remained behind. So, I am the children of Magan, and the Banyas are the children of Chagan. They are cousins. They're one people. So, you know, I said, imagine, imagine you. When I land you in Durban, you know, I said, park my car. Previously in Victoria Street, you know, where that uh, Machel was. Now I park it in Nickel Square garage. I said, look, I stop my car and you get down. And you come outside and you're fondling my mud guard and you're kissing my tires. <laughs> so somebody coming along, passing by, I say, what's wrong? What kind of inspection is this guy doing? He said, no, no, he's thanking my car. So what for? He give me a look. You know, the sun might have got him, the rain might have got him. What do people say? They're a bloody lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> look, who, who, who? I said, who stopped the car? <laughs> he says, you. I said, you see, if you have to kiss anybody, <laughs> you me. I'm not asking you to do that. But if you have to, kiss my hands, kiss my feet. Man, damn it, don't know my God and my feet. What do you mean? What do people say? You're a lunatic. And the guy sees it. The uncle, I never saw it in that light before. Yeah. But these are ways, ways you can approach them, explain to them, and you entertain them. Ah, you know, there are certain common denominators between the types and types of Hindus. You see, there are two types of Hindus. They call them the Aryan Hindus and the Dravidians. Dravidians are the Tamils and the Telugus. They are actually the natives of India, meaning the original people of India. Some 5,000 years ago, an Aryan invasion of India took place. My ancestors, they invaded India 5,000 years ago. And they conquered the land 5,000 years ago. Now, among them now, we have this Hindustani and the Banya people. They worship the same gods. The Tamils and the Telugus, they worship different gods, different names they give. The Hindustanis and the Banyas, they specialize on Rama, Sita, and Hanuman. Hindustanis and the Banyas. They commemorate Diwali a day after the Dravidians, the South Indians. They commemorate Diwali a day before, and the Aryan people, the Gujaratis, the Banyas, and the Hindustanis a day after. You know why? He doesn't know why. So I said, you know what? You see, Rama, we both specialize. It is the Hindustani more easy. It's the Hindustani of I said, look, you specialize on Rama, Sita, and Hanuman as gods. The South Indians on Shiva, Subramani, Ganesh, and endless other gods. So I said, you know what? Who was this guy, Rama? You know, according to the Ramayana, the Hindu epic of Rama, it says Rama was a prince of Ayodhya a kingdom in central India. His stepmother had a couple of sons. And one day she did something very nice for the old man. Maybe gave him a good massage, you see. And the old man was elated, happy, you know, you want, I don't know, you don't know how one feels, you know, uh, when you're old and somebody gives you a nice massage, you know, how you feel, you know. So the old man is elated. He says, look, darling, what do you want? Ask me and I'm prepared to give it to you. So happy. So she says, anything? He says, yes, anything. He's thinking about diamond, gold, jewelry, or the village or the town as a present, you know. What do you want? Ask and I'll give it to you. So she says, no, not now. When the time will come, I will ask. So a few years later, when the time came that Rama was to become the crown prince, 
that in the absence of the king, he will become king and her own son position will be jeopardized. So now she reminds the old man, he says, you remember one occasion you told me that you're prepared to give me anything? He said, yes. You still prepared to abide by that? He said, of course. I'm a man of my word. So she says, look, I want you to exile Rama, throw him out of the kingdom for 14 years. In the meantime, she knows her children will be in power. He said, 14 years, kick him out. So what? What a thing to ask. You ask me, diamond, gold, jewelry, village, town, I'm prepared to give it to you. Land, what do you want? What a thing to ask. He said, look, if you don't want to, you don't. But you said anything. He said, yes, but said, look, if you don't want to, you don't. But you said anything. So the old man got caught with his words. So he calls Rama, said, look, my son, between me and your mother, this is the problem. I promised her anything, and now she's holding me by that, and she wants me to exile you. And Rama is a gentleman. He said, look, Dad, I don't want you to compromise your promise. If that is so, I'm prepared to go, voluntarily. So Rama and Sita and Lakshman, Lakshman, Rama's brother, they go out into the wilderness. In the wilderness, the king of Ceylon, Ravan, this Ravana, he sees the beautiful Sita. Ravan is a darker skinned fellow because you see the equator is passing over the Ceylonese, the, Sh the Sinhalese, you know, the Sri Lankans for millions of years. They are better built than the people from central India. You know, we like the complexion people. We're coming from the north. You see, the sun is hitting us at an angle. And these dark skinned people, the sun is mm, brazing them all the time. So this dark skinned fellow, this Ceylonese Ravan, he sees this beautiful iron girl like a Maharaj girl, like a Sikh girl, like uh, one of my daughters, you see, it's this beautiful thing, and he's enamored, he wants her, but he can't go and grab somebody's wife and he's a sharpshooter, Rama was a sharpshooter. So he makes his brother, this is the history I read in the Ramayana, the Hindu book called Ramayana, the epic of Rama. So, uh, Ravana, he makes his brother by magic, by mesmerism, hypnotism, to appear like a buck, deer, and it goes in front of Rama and Sita. And when Sita sees it, she is tantalized. She wants the buck. She tells her husband, the husband is game, so I'll go and get it for you. So he starts chasing the buck. And running after the buck, and when he gets a chance, when he goes out of sight, he shoots it, and the thing falls to the ground. So he goes up to the buck. When he goes up to it, he's metamorphosed into a man. And he realizes that somebody is playing a trick on him. If somebody is playing a trick, there must be a motive. Sita's life must be in danger. So he rushes back to Sita, and Sita is gone. She's abducted by this guy, Rama. Taken away. Poor Rama, what is he to do? So he goes and finds Hanuman, the monkey god. This gentleman here, the monkey god. You see? He goes to Hanuman, the monkey god, and tells him, Sir, look, man, my father kicked me out of the kingdom. And somebody stole my wife. Won't you help me? And Hanuman is a gentleman. He's also a gentleman. He said, look, man, I'll help you, by all means. But you can't clap with one hand. You know, you clap with two. So he said, look, you help me, and I'll help you. So what do you want me to do? He said, come, come with me, follow me. So what is it? He said, look, me and my brother are twins. Who says that? Hanuman, the monkey god. He tells Rama, me and my brothers are twins. And my brother has usurped my kingdom. So I want you to help me to get my kingdom back, and I will help you to get your wife back. Fair? So very fair. So come. So they go to Hanuman land. There in Hanuman land, he said, look, I'm going to start a fight with my brother. A duel unto death. <coughs> Not like they do here. No, the grunting goes on, the tiger sing, and then, you know, playing. You know, playing. No, a real duel unto death. He's either you or me. So he goes and makes an offer. He said, look, brother, we want to settle this once and for all. Let's have it out. And whoever wins, he gets the kingdom. The other guy knows he's stronger than this guy. I said, right, okay. If that is how you want to settle affairs, I'm game. But in the meantime, he told Rama, this Hanuman tells Rama, he said, when I go and fight with him, you shoot him in the back. And he said, right. So they start a fight, and they're dueling, and after 15 minutes, half an hour, this guy comes back, panting for breath. He said, look, why didn't you shoot that fellow? You know, he said, if I go for the next round, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> he says, no man, between me and your brother, you are so identical. If I tried to shoot the other guy, I could have shot you. <laughs> <laughs> so what to do? If I go for the next round, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> he 
He said, look, you put a hanky around your neck, then I know that you are you and the other guy is the other person. He said, right. So he goes for the second round with a hanky around his neck and Rama manfully shoots the other guy in his back. So Hanuman gets his kingdom and he takes his troop of monkeys and they go to bring a cause, bring, bring a cause way. You see here now you see, I don't know it's a bit far for you people, these are all monkeys flying. See, there is a causeway being built, there is Lanka, this is India part. This is Rama, his brother Lakshman, and this is Hanuman, the monkey god. This is Shiva, the god almighty, and his wife Parvati. Right. But this is the cause with the building between India and Ceylon. And it took them 12 years throwing rocks into the sea. Throwing rocks into the sea. Bar, what is that? And after 12 years, they attacked Lanka, Sri Lanka. And they killed Ravan, and they bring Sita back. That is Deepavali. From Sri Lanka to India, that's Tamil land, Tamil Nadu. So they commemorate Diwali, festival of lights, happy that, you know, their god was able to get his wife back. Hooray, hooray. Then a day later, the North Indians, they started celebrating. Can you see the difference, the reason? Why the South Indians first, a day before, and the Middle Eastern uh, Indians, or the North Indians, a day after. This is the reason. Sounds very good. Beautiful story. I'm telling them, so, and everything, they know, there's nothing new. But I says, you know what? This creates certain questions in my mind. I says, you know, Rama is a god. He said, yes. But I said, you know, he didn't know that the buck was not a buck. Can you imagine? He's god, but he didn't know that the buck was not a buck. Somebody was deceiving him. Huh? He's god, but he didn't know, poor fellow. So that's what it looks like. That's what the book says. I said, you know, Rama is a god. But he wants the help of a monkey god to help him. He is God, but he needs a monkey god to help him out of his difficulty. In Congress. I said, yeah, look, he's a god. And yet, you know, I said, 12 years poor fellow had to wait to get his wife back. You see, Ravan, maybe he had a helicopter or a boat. You know, he took Sita across just like that. Rama took him 12 years you know, to build a causeway. I said, didn't he know how to make a raft? You know, these people that we are talking about, oh, my people, 5,000 years ago, there was a civilization in the Indus Valley. I went to Mohanji Daro and Taxila outside Rawalpindi. In, in Rawalpindi, Taxila, there are excavation works going on, and there's a museum close by. I visited it around the 1950s. At that time, I wasn't very much interested in what I'm talking about. No, it was just, you know, casually, just to come and tell people I visited taxi lab. From that point, I visited the place. And in the museum, I saw gold jewelry as modern as today's jewelry, made by my ancestors 5,000 years ago. 3,000 years before Jesus was born, they had a water bone sewerage in taxi lab. They made muslin cloth. They had muslin cloth, you can hold it in the palm of your hand. Now, that nation, they didn't know that dead wood floats. Is it possible? A nation was so civilized, they made gold jewelry, they made muslin cloth, but they didn't know that dead wood floats. I says, you know, in anthropology, study of man, we learn that mankind knew that dead wood floats long before he invented fire. You know, the primitive man standing by the riverside, the river is in flood, and he sees trees being washed away, and somehow the trees come somewhere nearby one of them, and then he wades in and he gets onto the tree and he sees this carrying his weight, you know, it's floating, and he's jumping, he says, hey, it's nice, it's a nice feeling. He discovered that dead wood floats long before he discovered how to make fire. And yet Rama, poor man, he didn't know how to make a raft. He could have crossed over, he wouldn't have waited 12 years. But the devil, Ravan, they say, is a devil. Look, the devil did it just like that. Amazing. God, he poor for 12 years. And he says, look, you, you, my friend, if somebody takes your wife behind the door for two minutes, and if you have the power to break the door down, break the wall down, what would you do? So you break it down. If you have the power, you wait. Somebody with your wife, your mother, your sister, your daughter, huh? you wait for 12 years to rescue her? What kind of a God are you? And what is that guy doing with his wife? Can you imagine? <coughs> because look, anybody steals somebody's wife, there's only one reason. <laughs> no matter how old the guy is. <laughs> Nobody steals people's wife to worship them. You're my Sita, you're very beautiful, you're very nice. <laughs> so the guy sees how ridiculous the situation is. I said, you see, my forefathers, they saw the light, and they 
extricated themselves. Or we have another experience. You see, <laughs> the experience with Hinduism is so vast. But if you look for it, the opportunities are there. Pass it on, pass it on. When you're passing on, you're actually programming him, you're brainwashing him away from what he's holding on to. Because his mind revolves. God! He can't save his own wife. As if somebody abducts your wife and you say, Oh, Rama, help me. Oh, Rama, help me. As a how can the poor Rama help you when he couldn't help his own wife? <laughs> <clears throat> I had a couple from Rhodesia, old Rhodesia. They call themselves spiritualist white people. They came to the office just some times back. And um, I said, now, how do you people come to find us? He said, no. He says, our priest, you know, he, at the, when we close for our Christmas holidays, he read from the Quran, you know, the birth of Jesus. And at the end of it, he said that, you know, this book speaks about Jesus and his mother in a nobler and a sublimer terms than anything to be found in the Bible. So they said, well, did you get it? He said, look, when I was in Zululand, I was reading the Sunday Tribune, and in that there was an advert, and I wrote for the Quran, and I got it, which he used. So that is where we got our address from, so we come to see you. He said, very good. And we found these spiritualist Christians, they call them some spiritualists. They don't belong to any other of these orthodox churches. They were so tolerant, they were so good, that while I'm talking to them, they're very, very happy with my explanation. But they had an attitude towards all religions, that all religions are the same and all religions are equal. They say all the rivers go into the ocean and all the paths lead up to the top of the mountain. That's actually the Hindu programming. This is how the Hindus program people. So look, all rivers go into the ocean. You know my mind. All the paths lead you to the top means to God. Any path you take, you reach there. See, whether you take Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, anything you take, you read there. What are you worried about? You don't have to become a Muslim, you don't have to become this or that. You just take any path, it'll take you there. You be a good Christian, I'll be a good Hindu. You be a good Muslim, I'll be a good Hindu. You, keep, you don't interfere with me, I don't interfere with you. Sounds very, 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 very you know, charitable. So these people now are brainwashed with that type of idea. So all religions are the same and they are all equal. And I'm telling them all religions are not the same and they're not equal. And the more I argue, the more it creates the impression that we Muslims are very intolerant. He's tolerant, he's prepared to concede that Islam is equal to his, but I'm not prepared to concede that all are equal. And the more I argued, shh, it was creating a bad taste in the mouth. So I said, now let's change the whole situation. So I'm telling them, I said, look, have you visited the mosque? He says, no. I said, come, I will take you to the mosque and see, you know, how you Muslims pray. And they came, take off the shoes. I won't go into details, took off the shoes. Why you make Lulu explain? So Salah, we came out, very impressed. Very impressed. I said, now, have you been into a Roman Catholic cathedral? I said, next door, you know, next to the Juma Masjid, is the Roman Catholic cathedral. He said, yes, yes. So I said, now, you know how the Muslims, you know, how they behave in their mosque, you know what it looks like, you know what a Christian uh, cathedral looks like. Have you seen a Hindu temple? He says, no. I said, come, I'll take you. So I took them in, the, in my car to Amgini Road, near that grave, old grave. Now, this main station, just a few hundred yards from there, is the largest temple in South Africa. The largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere, Durban. The largest temple in South Africa, Durban. Durban is unique. So I took them to the temple. Now, you know, when you tell people that it takes people to the temple. <laughs> but the Chinese have a saying, one picture is worth 10,000 words. So I'm telling you, Hanuman, you know what? I said, look, this is Hanuman. Ganesh! I said, look, this is Ganesh. He'll come to him again. So one picture is worth 10,000 words. So I said, let me take them to the temple. They said, all same? Let me hear. Get it from their mouth. So I took them to the temple. We also had to take off our shoes. We took them off. And we went, went into the main hall, a hall like this, about this size. And at the end of the hall, there were three cubicles. But before going <coughs> to the things, I got the supervisor. I said, 
sell, please, these are visitors from the Rhodesia, and they like to see what's going on. I said, no, 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 you explain. I said, no, no, no. In my mind, I said, let them get it from the horse's mouth. You see? I said, no, no, please, you know, you must explain to them what is going on, what you have got here. I forced the fellow. He didn't like it. So we started from the left-hand side. There were three cubicles, left-hand side. So in that room there, we see this big statue. This is the picture, but we see a statue. I said, who's this? They said, this is the son of God. <clears throat> this is the son of God. I said, what's his name? He said, his name is Ganesh. I said, oh. Outside, there was something like a bullock, black, made of stone. I said, what is this? He said, this God is looking after that God. He was Sumar Guardian angel. So like a guardian angel. You're laughing. These are the gods of our ancestors. Respect. He's, I said, he's got a body of a man and the head of an elephant. Can you see that? I said, how does it come about? How can a human being have an elephant head? So the story is that you see, this is the almighty God of the Hindus. Of, we are coming to him. We are coming to him just now. This is Siva. And this is his wife Parvati. This is Shiva and his wife Parvati. Now Shiva is God. But he thought of going and contemplating about God. So he's telling his wife, seeking permissions, look darling, let me go, I want to contemplate about He's God, but he wants to contemplate about God. So he goes into the Bundus. This is Hindu mythology. You see? So he goes into the Bundus in the wilderness, and for 12 years he's away, you know, contemplating about God. And after 12 years he returns, you know, bearded and all. He comes home, and he knows his house, and there outside the house there is a young boy, 12 year old, son of God, his son he didn't know. See, when he went, he didn't know his wife was pregnant. You see. So by the time he returns, there's a young boy, 12 year old, he's waiting there. Say, old man, where are you going? <laughs> old man, after 12 years, man, his wife is there. Demi knows, get out of the way, you bloody rubbish. He's the son of a god. He's not to be easily moved. <laughs> says, Nothing to eat. You know, I won't allow you to go. Because, you know, his mother's life is in danger. He's got that feeling for his mother. He says, no, I won't allow you to go. So Shiva, Shiva, he takes out his sword and chops off his head. In the meantime, the body falls. His son, he doesn't know that this is his son. He chops off his head. So Parvati comes out. So, oh, what have you done? Our son, our son. So what? He says, yes, this is your son. What have you done? He says, get the head quickly. Bring the head. What Chris Barnard couldn't do. <laughs> So looking for the head. And you know if God hits, how hard he hits. <laughs> across the seven seas. Across the seven seas. They're hunting for the head and they can't find the head. And the body's getting cold. So he said, look, man, any head will do. Bring a head and we'll put it on. So there was a baby, an elephant grazing there. They chopped off the head and they put it on. Chris Barnard couldn't have done that, I'm sure. Chris Barnard, poor fellow. You know? So he did. That's how he's got the elephant head. So this is the son of God. Siva is the father and this is the son. He's got an elephant head. This is how transplant took place. That must be about 4,000 years ago. Chris Barnard still couldn't do it today. So now we come to the center. The center, the main object, you can't see too well here. Here. You see this there. It's worth visiting. Wallah. We must visit the temple. You know why? Then you will appreciate what Islam has done for you. That had it not been for Islam, your mother and your sister and your wife and your daughter would have been garlanding this. If Islam did nothing for you but save you from garlanding this, I want to know what you're going to pay to Islam for that. Just that. This thing here. He's the Almighty God. Big thing like this, big column like this. It had a crown on top of it. So I'm asking for the benefit of my visitors. I said, what is this? So he said, this is the Almighty God. I said, what's his name? So his name is Shiva Linga. Now look, I know what Linga is. <laughs> See, Gujarati, I don't know how many of you know Gujarati, but Gujarati is my mother tongue and 40% of my language is Sanskrit. See, and I know I'm born in India, Shh, terminologies and all I know. So I'm asking this supervisor, 
for the benefit of the Rudations. I says, what is lingam? So the guy smiles. Doesn't the police tell us? What is lingam? So he starts to giggle. <laughs> I said, look, jokes aside, this is not a thing to joke about. <laughs> Almighty God, and you laughing, you're grinning. This is not something to joke about. I said, please tell us what is lingam. <laughs> he can't, he can't. He couldn't do it. He put open his mouth. So I had to put it in his mouth. So I said, is that the male organ of procreation? He said, yes. I said, oh. <laughs> you see, if you want to see this word, you must get the Oxford Dictionary. L-I-N-G-A-M, lingam. You find the Oxford Dictionary. It tells you it's a phallus. If you don't know what a phallus is, look it up in the dictionary. It'll tell you something else. And if you don't know that, it's that you have been wasting your father's money. <laughs> so I said, look, what have you got it in? It's in something. This thing was covered with a piece of cloth. No, I said, look, he's got no head. I'm telling him he's got no head. He said, no, he's got. But I said, look, I can't see the head. And he had a crown on top of it. So he says, he's got a mouth too. I said, but I've got no head. No, he says, he's got it. I said, okay, he's got it. <laughs> what can you do? So I can't see the head. He says, he's got it. I said, I got it. <laughs> what have you put it in? He said, that's a pedestal. I said, yeah, I don't know. What, what do you call it? This pedestal, what do you call it? He says, Yoni, Y-O-N-I, Yoni. You must look up the oh, Webster Dictionary. Oxford hasn't got it. I don't know why. He'll tell you what it is. So I said, what is Yoni? <laughs> I said, no, please, man. jokes aside. Tell us, what is your name? <laughs> so I said, is that the female organ of procreation? He said, yes. I said, oh, you got the male organ and the female organ? He said, yes. I said, oh, is that the almighty God? Yes. I said, oh. <laughs> These are the gods of my ancestors, your ancestors, man. Now, you must know. Then you will be able to appreciate what Islam has done for you. Otherwise, you know, we are ungrateful wretches, the whole lot of us. We are ungrateful. Just pay five times a day, you think you have paid for it. Just fasting in Ramzan, you think you have paid for it. What? What Islam has done for you, which has freed you from this? Lingam, Yoni, worship, what are you prepared to pay for that? You pay the million, it's not enough, man. You must go and see. I must tell our daughters, I was telling our daughters, you know, through this, our friend, Mr. Dabu, he's a lecturer there, Durban West. Durban West, when he was a young man, I'm telling him, I said, look, man, all those girls that are staying with you people there, I'm prepared to give you a free bus. I will take you to the temple. I'll bring you to the mosque, and I'll lecture to you what goes on. To explain to our daughters what you are bargaining for. When Allah says, Ulaika yadun ila nar, they are inviting you towards hellfire. Wallahu yadu ila jannati wal maghfira. Say, whereas Allah is inviting to his jannah and his maghfira. Why you leave that and go towards jahannam? Let them see. One picture is worth 10,000 words. Not the time when she's running away, then he said, no, you know, he's a mushri. That's the only time you say he's a mushri. So she said, what is that, daddy? Explain to her. What is, what is mushri? So he's not circumcised. So he said, what difference does that make? Explain to her, your daughter. She, maybe she's carrying his baby now. Is that the time to talk? Show them what it is. This is it. Islam has freed you. Where are you going back? The next one, next cubicle. Sugramani. The south of southern India. Four hands, two wives. You go further, another one, another one, another one. Oh, the gods and the goddesses, you know, of my ancestors. Shoot. I've got some pictures here. I've got some pictures here. I hope, you know, the timid don't get terrified or horrified. Look at this. This is Kalima. Look at that. Chain of skulls. Look at this. This is Kalima, our goddess, goddess of our forefathers. This is Krishna. Gopal, Gopal and Krishna, Gopal and Krishna, I mean cowherd Krishna, the cowboy Krishna. This is a cow, he's a herd cowherd, and this is God. Same God, <coughs> Krishna Sahib, you know, you find some young girls, the cow, cow herd girls, you know, girls who look after the cows. They are swimming in the water. Yeah, about a dozen of them. They were absolutely naked. Some of them, they put some size around them. But they were in the water naked. They left the sadis outside. So Krishna takes them onto the trees. He adorns the trees with the sadis. <laughs> this is according to the Rama, the, 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 the uh, um, what is it? Bhagavad Gita. You see? 
So the poor thing, you know, human beings, how long can you remain in the water? After an hour, two hours, you get cold, man. You know, the water becomes uncomfortable. All the pleasure is going away now. So they want to come out. They can't come out, they're naked. So they're telling Krishna, he says, please, man, let us have our sarees. So he says, no, you come out and I'll give it to you. So they came out, poor thing, with the hands around the private parts. So he says, no, you take off your hands and I'll give them to you. So they had to take off their hands so they can get the sarees back. This is all our forefathers, our gods, gods of our ancestors. Islam has finished. So now, so we went and saw. Then there are nine planetary gods <coughs> representing the planets. You must go and visit. Do a huge table, stone table, on which there are nine planets. And if a husband is sick, then the wife will go for nine consecutive Saturdays with burning camphor, going around, offering coconuts, fruit, money, and in nine weeks' time, the husband will get well. And the credit goes to the gods. I'm asking, how many times were you sick for nine weeks in your life? You, you, you. How many weeks were you sick in your life? Nine weeks? When nature takes its course, the man gets cured and the credit goes to the gods and the priests eat the fruits and take the money. <laughs> so when everything was over, I'm coming out, tying our shoelaces again once more. So I'm asking, I said, now, you know, what we saw here, either this is right, or when God spoke to Moses, as we read in the Bible, God says, I shall have no graven images before me, not even of the likeness of the things on earth, or in the heavens above, or in the waters beneath the sea, for my name is jealous and I'm a jealous God. <coughs> Nothing before me. Either Moses was right, or this is right. I'm asking, who is right? He said, no, Moses is right. I said, if Moses is right, then this is wrong. He said, yes. He said, they're not the same. He says, no. Right? There's a form. One picture is worth 10,000 words. Instead of explaining like this, like that. Mm. Come, come, come. Have a look at this. This is it. And there the picture, mental picture. Yeah. Now, between the two, you see any difference? Yes. Both can be right? He says, no. So if this is right, they're wrong, and that is right, and that is right, this is wrong. Yes. They're not the same? He says, no. Now, this is how, you know, you can explain. There are so many things, you know, as I said. You know, clinically taking up idea by idea, this reincarnation business. How did that come about? You see, when my ancestors, you know, 5,000 years ago, you see, they came from Mesopotamia of old, what is now modern Iraq. There were certain Indo-Germanic tribes, according to the anthropologist, 5,000 years ago. And the grazing ground was getting too tight for them. So they started moving out. One went north, the other came south through the Khyber Pass into India, and one remained. The one that went north are the Germans. They said, we are the Aryans, the master race. You remember Hitler? And swastika? You'll find some swastikas here too. You'll find some swastikas in the Hindu, Hindu pictures. Show you something else, no? Swastikas, swastikas, swastikas. What happened to the swastikas? There we in the way. So, the, the Hitler had his swastika, you know that cross? And uh, my Hindu cousin, they also have swastikas. I was wondering, what is this? Because Diwali time came, they made these beautiful designs and say swastikas. I said, this guy, why are they copying, copying Hitler? No, they were not copying Hitler. You see, 5,000 years back, this was the emblem of the Aryans. The Germans say, we are the Aryans, the master race. My cousins, now, if I was not a Muslim, I would also be saying, I'm an Aryan, you know, the master race. 5,000 years ago, you see, we were one people, the Germans, the Iranians, and my Banya cousins. We were one people 5,000 years ago. 5,000 years of intermarriage with the Nordic people, and the climate, and the diet made the Germans what they are. 5,000 years of intermarriage with the Indian people, and the climate made my people what they are. The Iranian is the nearest to what an Aryan ought to be, the Iranian. 
The Iranian is not an Arab. He's an Aryan. The ex-Shah of Iran, he was boasting, I'm Arya Mahar, the light of the Aryans. See, but he's also got a lot of Arab blood, a lot of Turkish blood, the Iranian nation, but he's the nearest to what a true Aryan ought to be. But ra racially, bone structure, the, the my Hindustani and Banya cousins, and the Iranians and the Germans are one racial stock 5,000 years back. Now, when they conquered India, see, they were a lighter complexion people, and they walked into India with the swords and the spears. They walked into a town, they said, this is ours. And the people gave in. No fight. He says, the gods have come to take their inheritance. He saw your boss. <laughs> walked into a village, he says, this is ours. So boss, take it. <laughs> they took India without fight. They took it. You know, the sword and the spears, these were docile people. The Indian people, very docile. They, that's 5,000 years ago. They just walked in, conquered. Now, my ancestors, you know, they were a very clever people. Look, 5,000 years ago, I said they made gold jewelry. 5,000 years ago, they made a yellow muslin cloth. 5,000 years ago, they had a water on Suraj. When the white man was living in caves like animals, my ancestors were civilized. What happened? Allah tells you in the Quran. He tells you what happened. He said, Kul si hu fil al. He said, travel through the earth. Fun zuru and see. Kaifa kana akibat what has happened to those before you? Kana aksar and nasi mushrikun. Another place, again, kul si rufilar, se kana aksar and nasi munkirun. Kana aksar and nasi kafirun. Again and again, Allah says, go and travel through the earth and see. What has happened to those before you? Most of them were mushriks. Most of them were unbelievers, kafirs. Most of them were ungrateful wretches. So, see what happened to them. Learn a lesson from them. Allah is telling you. These people, they were worshipping the elements. Rama didn't make a raft because he was afraid of the sea god. That's the reason. He knew how to, he knew that they would float. But he said, you know, the sea god might get angry. So, he says, no, no, S slowly, we'll put, you know, rocks into the water. You know, the sea god can still slip away. And then took them 12 years and they crossed. <clears throat> See, India is such a civilized nation. They couldn't cross to Mombasa. You know that? They didn't cross to Mombasa. But the Arabs came, and the Portuguese came, and the French came, and the British came and conquered our land. Right? They were not afraid of the sea god. <laughs> My cousins, they were afraid of the sea Look, they were mushriks, worshipping the elements. This is the reason. But, shh, highly intelligent people. So they said, look man, India is a land of teeming millions, even them, compared to themselves. They were perhaps 10,000 men, women, and children. But because they were fighting people, they conquered the land. Now what to do? They had the sense to know what Jesus Christ only said 2,000 years ago. He told his people in the Garden of Gethsemane that he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. It means if force of arm is the thing that justifies your existence, by force of arm somebody is going to do away with you. This is not a means for justifying power or anything. See, my Hindu ancestors, they knew this 5,000 years ago. So they said, you know, we must weave an intellectual bondage around these people, the Indians. Physical bondage, because it is visible. Once you realize what it is, you can easily break it. Like in Mozambique, 500 years, the Portuguese ruled Mozambique. When the African came to realize, the Mozambique, huh? so what makes this guy to rule us? He is not stronger than us. He is not more than us. He said, ah, it's his technology. Ha, ah, it's his gun. But we must also get the gun. They said, no, they won't let us have it. So China said, we will let you have it. Russia said, we will let you have it. They had their own reason. So what the Portuguese had for 500 years, they lost in 10 years. Once you know what it is that's subjugating you, once you see the shackles, the bondage, you know how to break it. Physical bondage, because it is visible, it is more easily broken. My ancestors, they wove an intellectual bondage. Intellectual. Intellectually, when you slave a man, enslave a man, he's happy in his enslavement. So they saw the people in India, these South Indians, the Tamils and the Telugu, the natives of the land, they're worshipping Siva. 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 This is the god of ancient India. Siva. So my ancestors, they told these guys, he said, look, we worship the same god, man, but we call him Shiva. What's the difference? You say Siva, we say Shiva. Same, same. 
But you see, Shiva, when he wanted to make man, he took the form of Brahma. And Brahma, as the creator, from his head he created the Brahman. From his arms he created the Rajputs, the warrior caste. From his stomach he created the merchants and the farmers. And from his feet he created the untouchables, untouchables, you, teeming millions of India. You are to be the viewers of wood and the clothes of water. You must carry our shit buckets. You must bury our dead animals. You must become our shoemakers and our barbers. That's your privilege. And if you do that job well, in the next life, you have a chance of becoming a farmer or a merchant. And if you are a good farmer and a good merchant, the next life you become a Rajput, the warrior caste. And if you become a good Rajput, in the next life you become a Brahman. Once you are Brahman, you don't have to be reborn. You see, from there you merge with God. You get Nirvana. You become one with God and you rule the universe. Mm, beautiful song. <laughs> it worked. 4,000 years. It's working. It's still working today. Intellectually, you enslave people. Hindustani ladies. From the way they are attired, I can say they are Hindustani. I can't describe it, but I know when I see a Hindustani in a Tamil, I know this is Hindustani, this is Tamil. There's something about them, the way they wear the sun. So I stopped the car. There are a couple of ladies with some children. So I stopped the car. I said, Baini, tum log kahan jata? Sisters, where are you going? He said, Darban jata. I said, get inside. So they got inside. I start the car. So I said, since they answered my question in Hindustan, he said, Baini, tum log kahan jata? I know they are Hindustan, 100% now. So I said, I'm asking, I said, Baini, tum log kahan reta? Tum log singh reta ke maharaj reta? What are you? Are you singh? I said, what are you then? You are neither fish nor fowl, what are you? <laughs> he said, look, I hear that, I hear. You know, the untouchables among the Hindustanis. I hear, he's a low caste among the Hindustani people. So I said, Baini, this is all bloody rubbish. You know, my forefathers, they created all this to enslave you people. Right? There is no truth in it. They were fighting tooth and nail against me. They said, no, Malik ne humko aisa banaya. This is the beauty of an intellectual bondage. You see, when you want to free the slave, the slave doesn't want to be free. That's how clever my forefathers were. So they invented all these things to enslave the people, to rule the people better. And they did a beautiful job. What they went out to do, they did it. But now it is our duty to free them from these bondages. The Christian is making inroads into the community. The guy is free for all. See? The reason why we are not getting converts is because we don't open our mouths. We are too damn busy fighting ourselves in this ocean of Christianity, in this ocean. We are also in an ocean of Hinduism. We are a minority of a minority. But we are not interested in propagating the faith. And the punishment for that is, is there for you to see. It's a punishment of Allah. Allah doesn't come down from the heaven with a whip in his hand. The thing that you value most, your daughters. The daughters are going up. Hold safe, hold safe. Says, we are busy. Says, look, our food is not good. That is what the people are saying. Look at us. We are not perfect. I'm asking, when will you be perfect, my son? My boy, you tell me. Huh? I said, go and ask the greatest alim you know. Ask him whether he's perfect. Whether he's perfect. If he said yes, I say, he's shaitan, big shaitan. If the man says yes, I'm perfect, I say, he's big shaitan. The great man. In humility, says, no, I'm a Mubahad Gunai Kaakum. May Allah have mercy on me, pray for me. This is every man, good man, will tell you that. So when will you be perfect? When will you open your mouth? In the meantime, the enemy is going to wait for you. Is he waiting? Look at the example of our Nabi Karim and the Ashabas. They give you examples. The very people who are stopping you from doing propagation, they give you beautiful examples. But they can't see the natural consequence of that example they are giving. I am listening in the West Street Mosque. A great man from India is giving this beautiful example. He says, you know, in the Hajjat al-Wida, the farewell pilgrimage, the last pilgrimage, there were 110,000 ashabas. 
and our Nabi Karim وسلم, in his first sermon, khutbah, he's asking them, he says, have I delivered my message to you? Has my message reached you? And they, as a, in one voice, they all said, most certainly it has. So he lifts up his eyes towards heaven and says, Ya Bari Ta'ala, you be a witness to this, that I have delivered my message. And you, my brethren, that are present here, pass this message to those who are absent, who are not here. The message that you have received, pass it on to those who are absent. And they scattered throughout the world. Out of the 110,000 Muslims that were there, not even 10,000 are buried in the lake. What happened to them? They went away in a flying saucer. What happened? What happened to them? No, they understood the meaning of our Nabi Karim spread out throughout the world. They went to India, they went to China, they went to Indonesia, they went to Nigeria, they went as far as, came as far as Mozambique. They did the job. That's the example. You're giving that example, but he says, now you know what? You people must come along. You know, we're going to have a little jamaat there to fulfill that example. We're, we're going to gather somewhere. In some mosque, in some backward place, in forward road, and you come there and you know, we're going to stay there for four days, or we're going to stay there for 40 days. The example is they spread out throughout the world, looking for who? For Muslims? Wanting to convert the converted? No! Were the Arabs perfect? I'm asking, were they perfect? You know 75% of the Khulafai Rashidin were assassinated? Do you know that? Oh, Nabi Karim Salah has just passed away. You know, before they can bury him, there was squabble going on. They were perfect. In the lifetime of our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi he says, this is what he said, ask the alim, he'll tell you. He said, he said that, you know, people who don't come for Friday prayers, I feel like going burning the homes. In, the, in his lifetime, there were Muslims who were not making Juma. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. I'm asking, why would they go out to foreign lands when Arabia itself was not perfect? It was not. Bibi Aisha Siddiqa and Hazrat Ali, armies, both sides, Muslims, Ashabas, they're killing each other. Who killed Imam Hussein? Kafirs? Christians? Jews? Who? Muslims. You know that? So what are you talking about perfection? I said, look, my dear brothers, you know, tell my daughters at home as well, we must do our best. What little you know, start, man, start. Talk to the people. Bring them over. Win them over, win them over, and our salvation depends upon that. In this ocean, if you don't do the job, willy-nilly you will get absorbed. We we'll lose to the Christians and we are losing to the Hindus. Our daughters, we are losing wholesale to the Hindus. The answer is, change the people before your, 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 your features get changed. Change them. And with these words, my dear brothers, uh, I'm very, very grateful to Brother Rafi for creating this opportunity for me to come and share with you on this subject of Islam and Hinduism. I know the subject is very vast and I can't say I have done very much justice to it, but I hope that this is the beginning. It will give you a start and one day, inshallah, if you keep on doing the job, knowledge will come to you, more and more knowledge. This is how it comes. See? From what has been said, Mr. Dirat, as in all his lectures, we will allow a few minutes, it is late. If anybody wants to ask any questions, would like to clarify any point, we will just allow uh, a few questions in the time that we have. They all converted. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is let the ball rolling. Uh, is it <coughs> possible that Rama and Krishna, though they may have been uh, transformed into gods, could have been maybe prophets uh, at that time sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, in the Holy Quran, we are made to accept this principle that every nation has had a guide. And there never was a people without a warner means a prophet being sent down with them. And again in the Holy Quran, and to every nation a guide. This is his law. If Allah is not partial with regards to his material gifts, 
to the sinner and the saint he sends them, his rain, his fresh air, his sunshine on everybody, why would he deprive any group of people from his spiritual blessings? Guide us. The reasoning is not. He shouldn't. He wouldn't. Then what about these people? Is it possible that they could have been men of God? I believe it is possible. From this experience, from the Christian Bible, you see, in the Christian Bible, which is Jewish and Christian both put in one. They call the Old Testament and the New Testament. You read there about certain prophets in this book. You read there about Lut alayhi salam, Hazrat Lut alayhi salam. In this book they tell you that he, his daughters seduced him night after night. Lut alayhi salam. He committed incest with his daughters and he made them pregnant. You believe that? Would you believe that? No. Because Allah tells us, our principle is that every prophet, we say, is sinless. Every prophet is sinless. And Hazrat Lut alayhi salam, we say, he was a prophet of God. If he was a prophet of God, he is sinless. Could he be cohabiting with his daughters and be getting bastard children from them? The answer is no. But the book says so. Had it not been for the Quran testifying that Lut alayhi salam was a messenger of God, would you have believed that he was a prophet? Would you? A man committing incest with his daughters? No. Can you see that? Nuh alayhi salam. He said Nuh alayhi salam. In the Quran is testified. There is Allah's Nabi. Sinless. But the Bible tells us, tells us that he got drunk and he was lying naked. You believe that? Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam. You believe in him. Hazrat, but his father, Daud alayhi salam. You know, he goes and commits adultery with Uriah's wife, daughter Shiva. According to the Bible, from court, and he had that guy, that woman's husband killed, murderer. Would you believe that he was a prophet of God? No. But Allah says so. He is Allah's Nabi, we believe. He is Allah says he's sinless, we believe. Can you see it? Suleiman alayhi salam, he had a thousand wives and concubines. Thousand, one thousand. And in his old age, he made a temple for the worship of idols for his wives. You believe that? Jesus Christ, you read the Bible. He insults his mother. He says, woman, what have I to do with you? Woman! Is that how you talk to your mother? You expect a prophet of God to talk to his mother like that? And he describes himself as a wine, wine bibber and a gluttonous eater. And ever and again, according to the Bible, he is ever you know, abusive to his people, the elders of his people. He says, you generation of vipers, you snakes, you hypocrites, you fools, you wicked and adulterous generation, haram, kor, kom. You expect a prophet of God to talk like that? On that evidence alone, we would have rejected 100% all the prophets mentioned in the Bible. But because Allah Bari Tala says, look, these were masoom, they were sinless, we accept it. We accept that they were prophets and the stories are false. We said the stories about them are false. So similarly, about Rama, you know, we don't know what would happen. About Krishna, he could have been a good man. Buddha, could he have been a good man? But these are stories woven around. You know, certain personalities, exaggerated, fairy tales and all. So. I would be charitable. I wouldn't say I can't say that they were prophets. But I said, look, they could have, you know, they could have been chosen by God because this was long before our Nabi Karim Sallallahu was born. But as the stories are woven around the prophets of the Bani Israel, similar thing can also happen to the prophets of the Aryans. So from that point of view, as the stories are told to us, we say now, look, these are fabrications, you know, additions, frills are being added, like this Hanuman fellow, Hanuman. The monkey god. See, my neighbor in Verulam, Mr. Naidu of the Divine Life Society, a little older than myself. Mm. This man, he invites, invites me to his home for a cup of tea. As soon as I build my house, he calls me. So I go along, sit down in his library, and he had more books on religion than in the Gandhi Library in Queen Street. So when I saw all those books, and being in the Divine Life Society, I'm asking him, I says, you know, Mr. Naidu, this Hanuman, Hanuman, you know, this monkey god. I said, was he a animate creature, you know, flesh and blood, or was he a machine, a robot? So he says, no, he was animate, you know, something like us, flesh and blood. I said, was he alone by himself, or did he have wife and children? So he said, no, 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 he also had wife and children. You know, there was a breed of them. I said, what happened to them? I says, you know what? Today in India, we have hundreds of different breeds of monkeys. In India. But there is not one Hanuman breed. This breed is not there in India. It is not there. 
You know, this is like an Apollo, like a Hercules. You know, big thing like that. You know, but with a monkey face and with a tail of a monkey. Not like the velvet monkeys you find in the Burman bush. You know, the little things. No. This is like a giant Apollo, Hercules, like that. What that thing? Uh, tiger thing. You know, all like that, tiger thing. You carry big, big rocks and, you know, put into the ocean. There's little monkeys, you know, while they were throwing those little stones, if there were those little monkeys, like the velvet monkeys, still that causeway wouldn't have been completed. <laughs> so you need somebody big. So I'm asking now, what happened to them? Mr. Naidu, what happened to them? I says, you know, we have a written history. India, 5,000 year old. So, if a flying saucer came and took them away, it must be written somewhere. An atom bomb fall and destroyed them all, there must be something written in our history. Mr. Naidu, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look it up for me. He says, yes, Mr. Dillard, I'll look it up for you. After a month, I visit him again. I said, Mr. Naidu, did you find anything? He said, no, 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 not yet. I'll look for it. I said, okay. Diwali comes along, I go again. I said, Mr. Naidu, did you find anything? He says, no. I says, you know what? I said, there was no such thing as a Hanuman breed of monkeys. So, but my book says, so it can't lie. I said, no, no, I'm not telling your book is a liar. Your book is not lying. But there was no such thing as a Hanuman breed of monkeys. So, what makes you to say that? I said, you see, if there was such a thing, they would be in the front of our eyes all the time that these are the monkey gods that help our God. Again and again, every time you see you say, Salam, he helped our God. This guy's retrieved our wife, God's wife. You can never forget. Every time you see them, you say, these are the benefactors of our God. But there's no such thing. You know why? Because there was no such thing. But what about my book? I said, no, your book is not lying. I said, you see, I am an Aryan, my nation. We are the Aryan nation. Because Muslims is rubbish. It comes from nothing. But to him, I said, look, my nation is an Aryan nation, the master race. And we were looking down upon your people as Vanaras. Vanaras means monkeys. Like the Africana. He calls the African Babujan. So what is Babujan? Babujan means baboon. What is baboon means monkey. You ask him who's doing his gardening for you, he says the Babujan. So who's working in the mines for you, he says the Babujan. But he's talking about the poor African. He's not Babuja. Similarly, we were calling you people Wanaras. Wanaras mean Wanaras. Wanaras mean monkeys. You see? So, Rama goes to one of your people, nice people, kind-hearted people, one of your chiefs, your Mkosi. You know, your Mkosi, like Mkosi Bukhile. He says, your Mkosi. He says, look, man, my, somebody, my father kicked me out of, the, of my kingdom, and somebody stole my wife. I want you to help me. Oh, I said, he's happy. He said, look, you give me a helping and I'll also do that. So he takes his troop of monkeys and they build a causeway. Right. And they go and get themselves killed and they did the job. They retrieve Sita. Right. But now, in the mind of Rama, he says he's made a monkey out of the guy. They ate their own food. They slave for 12 years, free of charge. For nothing. They did it. You know, they're such good people, the Tamils and the Telugus. They did the job. So in the minds of the arrogant fellow, he says, if we made monkey out of this fellow, right? we used them and he did it for nothing, everything. His food, his labor, everything. He did the job. And when he went into battle, so many got killed. For what? For a foreign race. So he said, we made monkeys out of them. So that's what the wise man wrote. He says, this one of us, you know, these monkeys, these babujans, you know, we, the, the, the king among them, Hanuman, he was like this and like that, and he did, and he brought his people and they worked like lightning. So now the artist, there were no photographers there. So the artist now, he says, man, they were Wanaras. But, you know, little Wanaras, like the one in Burman Bush, they can't build a causeway. So you must give them a big build. Ti tiger sing size. Everybody. Right? Then he said, but he was a Wanara. So they make a monkey face. And he says, a Wanara, so they give him a tail. But there was no... I said, you know, that Wanara, that Hanuman is you. You. <laughs> you. My God, every learned man I have spoken to. I said, in the absence of a, 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 another theory, you have to accept my theory that this is it, that you are the Hanuman breed, you. In the minds of my people, even now, you know, the Banya, he looks down upon the Hindustan. The Hindustan, he looks down upon the Tamil and the Telugu. As what? These are all bloody monkeys, man. So, <laughs> this, this is what it is, you see? So, things like this can happen. You know, over a period, you add frills and you put, you know, give the guy a monkey face and then you give him a tail, uh, all that. But all these things didn't exist. These are the Tamil and the Tamil <coughs> chefs. They have made monkeys out of them. 
Freedom from that. Freedom. And in freeing them, there's benefit for us. You're freeing, actually freeing yourself by freeing them. And once we allow them to be Christianized, I tell you, you know, the respect that they have for us. At the moment they have respect. The Hindu has respect. I'm not talking about your competitors in the lakhs. That's different. I'm talking about the ordinary man, the ordinary Hindu, the Tamil, the Telugu, the Naidu, the Pillai, the Gavanda, the Mudli. He has got respect for you. As soon as he's Christianized, finish. Now he wants to make mess in your head. Now he knows that you're going to go to hell. At the moment, the Sullah follows the Guru. Ask him. And I'm telling him, and he agrees. I said, look, ask your father, your grandfather, if he's still alive, that if he needed five pounds in the good old days, and there's a Hindu shopkeeper and there's a Muslim shopkeeper, who will you go to? No hesitation. He said, go to the Muslim, Sullah fellow. I said, what for? Why Sullah fellow? Why don't you go to the Hindu? I said, no, no, no. You know, they know, said, the Sullah fellow is all right. He can't say no. He's got respect for you. Why don't we, you know, use that respect to bring them in, make them our brothers? Instead of waiting for our daughters to convert them, why shouldn't we convert them? 